Now, let's continue with the program. And actually, I'm being always interested in, in uh, wearable devices. And uh, also, Tyson is, of course, also providing something like that. So I've been looking really forward to this presentation. Uh, let's uh, welcome Irfan Azrar over here. And uh, let's see uh, what this presentation is going to be about. Thank you, Eddie. Appreciate that. That's a really great introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming to my presentation. Uh, my name is Erfan Asrar. I am with the Intel Security Group, also known as McAfee. Um, as you can see, the McAfee logo is still there. It's still on my shirt as well. So um, this is the agenda for today. But I just wanted to also call out the goal that I have here. I wanted to give you guys enough information about Tizen as a platform, um, how to look for files that are related to Tizen, how to analyze them, and make you dangerous enough so that if you do come across a threat for that platform, you would know what to do, and you'd recognize it. So that is my goal here. OK, so Tizen, th this is always the biggest confusion. The pronunciation is Tizen, as Eddie correctly pointed out. And it's not um, Tizen, but it, it is something that we get a lot of people asking questions about. It's a Linux-based operating system for devices, including smartphone, tablets, in-vehicle information systems, devices, smart TVs, laptops, smart cameras. So the reason for that is this guy. So Tizen is a collaboration of Intel and Samsung, but because Samsung is so big on the consumer electronics space, they wanted to have a platform to, to basically consolidate all their electronic devices and in the direction in, you know, in, in the direction we're headed where a lot of devices in this uh, day and age of the Internet of Things are, are you know, they have, we have the need for one device to talk to another device. This was the perfect platform for, this was the perfect time for Samsung to actually launch a new operating system. So as Eddie pointed out, it's, it's not just a mobile operating system. It's actually because of circumstances that arose. Um, Tizen was originally supposed to be launched on a smartphone um, due to some complications. That did not happen. It will happen, um, I believe, end of November. The first target market is India. And um, right now, it exists. You can actually go buy devices that actually have the Tizen operating system. Um, it's the NX3000 camera, the Galaxy Gear S. This will be sold, I think, starting next month from what I've just been told. It, this actually has a three, um, it has a, uh, it's a data modem, 3G device. So it's actually a standalone smartphone slash wearable device. And the smartphone and the, uh, the Samsung TV operating system will be replaced with Tizen. Um, so it, it's out there right now. And uh, it's, it's something that you guys can actually take a look and get your hands on and get uh, started investigating now. So the origins of Tizen go back to 2008, where there's roughly about five platforms here, but the Lebo, which is Linux mobile, that Samsung was originally um, using, planning to replace their feature phones with. Um, and there's Moblin, which stands for mobile Linux. See the connection to Linux mobile, mobile Linux. And then there's Mimo, which was supposed to be the successor to the Symbian operating system from Nokia. So you know, because there was so much uh, you know, similarity between these guys. They were both, they were all literally just um, layered operating systems built around the Linux kernel. So it just made perfect sense for these guys to merge with these guys, come up with a Migo operating system. Um, around that same time in 2009, Samsung decided to keep this project going, but they decided to come up with a new consumable version of an operating system to replace um, the operating system on featured phones called Bada. Now, if you haven't heard about Bada, it has not taken off in North America, but it's, it, it does have success in Korea, Samsung's native home market. And it, it, it's an ecosystem. It's got smartphone devices as well as an app market, as well as um, close to about 4,000 apps, last I checked. So to some extent, it was successful. So Samsung wanted to keep this guy going. And it was, you know, to their credit, the, the Bada app ecosystem was never violated with the malware which, you know, let's just face it, even Apple iTunes or Google Play can't take as a credit. So, so they, they wanted to, they, they said something that was really interesting. They wanted to keep that going. So that's where Tizen came from. 2011, a lot of these guys decided, you know, this is exactly what we want to consolidate, take the attack surfaces of these different operating systems, bring the best of breed practices, and uh, Tizen was born. 
So since 2011 um, till today, this is where Tizen stands. The first uh, vulnerability for Tizen was uh, in January 1st of 2013, uh, 2012 It was basically a little issue that um, was discovered on the dev, the dev phones where um, despite the fact that you turned off the Bluetooth setting on the, on the dev phone, it really didn't turn off. And um, unfortunately, any device around you, anybody who was war driving something that could pick up the thing. But then again, it was a dev phone. It was never ever meant to be in production. So it wasn't such a big vulnerability. Uh, the biggest change after that, uh, at this point in time, um, app developers were encouraged um, by Samsung and Intel to look at Tizen as the platform for um, web app development. The, the HTML5 platform was something that Samsung and both Intel were heavily promoting, and they said this is what you want to, if you are planning to be in this space, you want to leverage your HTML5 skills, your web app development skills, and you want to make a profit about it, this is the platform you want to do it. And it, it's a pretty you know, reasonable idea if you think about it, because not only are you exposed to smartphone app development, but you will also be able to extend that app experience, if you're a developer, to, to other platforms. So, um, so in 2013, um, basically, actually, let's go back for a second here. Uh, so BADA, as I said, you know, had some good characteristics. The, uh, the underlying runtime in the BADA framework was actually ported over to the Tizen platform. So for the first time, in addition to web apps, um, Tizen also had the ability to run native apps. Um, and the one thing that was really, really um, a big point for Samsung to, for developers was the fact that native apps and web apps are both first class citizens. There would be no or capabilities or API calls between the two. So if you're a hardcore C developer, um, you, you want to basically develop your apps and give people uh, you know, that experience on your native runtime, or then you can actually do that. Or if you're a web developer, you want to call APIs that are, um, you know, that are not possible. That, um, so there's no restriction, essentially. So 2014 is when the first phone will be launching. Um, hopefully, knock on wood, it will be in November sometime, and that's when we also kind of expect the App Store to be launched. So this is the architecture. If anybody has ever seen any of Dan Bronstein's presentations about the Tizen architect, the Android architecture, the Dalek framework and stuff, like, you, you'll see that there's, there's a lot of similarities, and that's the first thing people ask me, like, hey, is this a ripoff? And it, it, it's the same thing, essentially. And again, the key concept here, it's a layered operating system built on the kernel, uh, a Linux kernel, and then the different layers actually are, dep you know, depending on what device you're using, if it's, um, it's a smartphone, it's a vehicle, um, it's a camera, the different layers would be there, and the, the three most common layers is, of course, the, the, the core system framework, which has all these, uh, you know, the app framework, the system, base, connectivity, the services that are provided by the device you are, and this is dependent on the device you're using. Um, then, of course, you have the web framework providing the runtime, uh, the, the framework to run the uh, apps, um, either if you're developing in native or, or web. So Tizen runtime packages. A package in Tizen um, is nothing more than a container or executable content, essentially. Now, each package has a unique package ID. Um, and within each app, uh, within each package, you can have multiple apps. Now, each one of them has to have a unique app ID, um, as well as the app name. The app name can overlap, but the app ID has to be unique. Um, all apps in a package share resources as well as the privilege defined at the package level. So you can have multiple apps within a package, but they all have to have, they, they all would have to work off of the privileges defined at the core app level. Tyson Framework supports three types of packages, um, web packages, uh, sorry, web applications, native apps, hybrid apps, which is a mixture of actually web apps and native, and it also supports the installation of RPM packages. And, and, and the RPM package is a note I put in there. Um, is that despite the fact that web applications and native applications require you to explicitly sign the application for installation, um, RPM packages don't. I, I consider this to be a security issue. And, and, and the guys at Tizen, they also kind of, yeah, yeah, we think it is. It's, they're also going to change this in the next release. So a web application is 
based on the W3C widget packaging specification, which is exactly how the, the Firefox OS um, is um, dealing with uh, packages as well. And all the apps on Firefox, they, they can easily be ported over to Tizen without too much trouble. Um, you know, it's HTML5 again as the, the core um, development engine, uh, engine there, as well as um, the, the framework people are asked to develop their apps around. A web application must conform to the following. It has to be a zip archived, and the extension will be WGT rigid. So if you ever see this, it's either a Firefox app or it's a Tizen app. And this is what it looks like. So the app ID, again, I said the app ID has to be unique. It's a 10-byte long string. It's about uh, four levels down if you unzip the file. And then when you do, you, know, you can see the entire content. So reverse engineering or getting this to, um, getting a black box system running to, to basically get the outputs of a web app are, are, are very, it's not trivial at all. Um, hybrid and native applications must conform to the following convention. Again, it has to be a zip archive. The, uh, the extension in that case is TPK. That's the file extension for native applications. The package structure looks like this. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's encompassing of the web application as well as what, um, what is used to store the, um, the ELF binaries. So having said that, if, you're, if you have any skills on the Symbian platform, um, dec you know, basically decompiling ARM binaries, um, you're in luck. Your skill sets can be used here. It's very easy to, do, to decompile and um, debug. Uh, elf binaries here, because they really are just elf binaries, and that's where they are stored. So application security and access control overview. Um, so at the core of the Tizen security enforcement policy um, is privilege control and application signing, both of them you know, taken from best of breed practices from Android and Apple, uh, which includes process isolation, sandboxing, and mandatory access control. This is called SMAC. I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute. So some of the key principles um, that Tizen uses is all applications will run with the non-root user ID, including system daemons. So nothing on a Tizen device, um, maybe smartphone, camera, or anything else should be running this. And there's one or two exceptions, but there are bugs and the guys at Tizen are working on bringing this down. And again, it's, it's, it's because of the, uh, the uh, consolidation from the, uh, you know, uh, hang on, it's because of the consolidation over here, getting all of these guys to, to, to be nice to each other and talk to each other and getting, you know, the best of breed practices here, here is not easy. So. Okay, so an application, again, in the sandbox um, world, an application is only allowed to read and write files in its home directory and shared media directory. That's it. You, you can't access anything else. Um, and if you do, it's, it's basically because you've either rooted the device or you have somehow exploited or broken the sandbox. Privileges. Now, privileges are very similar to the concept of permissions in Android um, with, with little difference, and I'll we'll call that in a second here. Tyson provides API level access control for sensitive operations. So essentially what it does is all the APIs have been uh, separated or grouped, actually clustered, uh, depending on their security attack surface. So you can have access to some of them depending on who you are. So if you're a, plat if you're a general public, just one-off developer, you can access only a subset of the entire API set. Same thing, if you're a partner, you get to access more APIs. Platform is the ultimate, you basically ties in or the carrier. You, you basically can access all the APIs. And it, it's similar to the concept of how system uh, permissions are used on Android, where certain apps can only access certain APIs used by the system if they're signed by uh, the system signature. Um, applications without proper uh, privileges cannot use the APIs. It doesn't matter if you have the permissions. It, it is dependent on the signature. and um, the other thing that's interesting about uh, Tizen application is that whereas on Android you require one signature, um, on Tizen there are two. And again, just as I mentioned before, depending on the signature that you have, 
that is the, the essentially determines what is the, um, privilege, the API privileges that you can access. So an author signature is basically the author, and that has to be registered with the Tizen Development Certificate Authority, which is the Tizen store. And uh, the distributor signature, this is generated by the, the Tizen Association or the Tizen store, and is usually only assigned to, to say, large carriers or, or somebody who Samsung trusts enough to, to basically allow them to either develop the platform or extend it, or, or you know, somebody who is um, in need of special APIs or something like mobile, you know, like actual cars, the in-vehicle entertainment system. So here, here's an example of the APIs, and I've got this documented in the paper that gives you a list of all the APIs. For example, um, I don't know if you can see that, the app certificate, I believe that's what it says, can only be accessed by the partner um, signature. Um, same thing with uh, things like, um, uh, let's see, let's take a look at here. Bookmarks and stuff can only be accessed by platform. Um, and stuff that, you know, we take granted on Android, for example, changing a system setting, that can only be done by platform. Um, so, you know, if you're a malicious app, you try to uninstall a security application, unless you have a partner signature, that's not going to happen. So the other thing different in the Tizen um, you know, security model is, um, and it's something that Android actually tried to adopt with app ops, um, but for one reason or the other, they decided not to go ahead with it, is that you can define permissions post installations on an app by the user. So in Android, you know, it's, it's a policy of um, all or nothing. So you have an app that's requiring SMS privileges or, or, I don't know, connection to the internet, but you're not comfortable with that app talking to the internet for some reason or you don't want it to be uh, you know, somehow accessing your contact database, you can't do anything about it. The only choice is you uninstall the app. Um, but on Tizen, by default, um, what you can do is you can basically take that granular permission level and say, you know what, I don't want this app after installation accessing my contacts databases anymore, or I don't want it accessing my location information anymore. Now, the problem here and the trick here is that app developers have to keep in mind that this is happening in the background and this is, this is something that the user has an option. So they have to come up with error checking routines on their own. The system won't tell you if somebody's disabled it so your app is basically prone to crash if it's not, which is one of the reasons why AppOps wasn't officially launched. Now, Smack is a Linux security module that determines the process, uh, how processes interact with each other and share information. In, in a nutshell, this is how um, Tizen basically achieves sandboxing. So the key concept here, if, if there are two entities and they want to communicate with each other, they need to have one of these, a labels that basically identifies, for each of those objects, you're gonna have a label. So for example, um, I have a label that says I can talk to her, and she has a label that she can talk to me. And you can get more granular on that, and you can say between 6 p.m. and 6 p.m., and you, know, you can restrict it more. So that, that is essentially the core here that is uh, driving Smack. And, and the entire thing uh, compared to, like, say, SE Linux is simplicity is the goal that we're going for. You know, um, I, I think somebody was telling me, like, SE Linux was um, rejected because of that over Smack. And of course, Smack is part of the Linux upstream. Um, so every app has its own label, which also can be used as a way to identify the app in addition to the app ID. Um, and Tizen uses these Smacks uh, labels to control all apps, API, devices, functions, um, and everything. So basically, not only are apps um, restricted by Smack on, Smack on what they can do and they can communicate, you can actually create Smack policies around um, two components within a Tizen device and how they communicate and how they interact. So content security framework. Now this is uh, McAfee or Intel security group's contribution to the Tizen um, ecosystem. Now th this is a vendor uh, agnostic framework. Um, you know, what we realized here and uh, you know, it was based on the experience of Android that um, sandbox operating system, they don't make it easy for AV vendors to do what they need to do. So it would be ideal to have a platform or a layer to work off of which actually exposes hooks 
so that you can basically, you know, if you find something malicious or if you're planning to write your own engines to scan files or scan URLs, you would have the ability to, to basically uh, not worry about how would you actually remove the app and stuff like that. You focus on what you need to do, which is write the, the code for the engine, and that's it. And that's what um, Symantec, or I'm sorry, well, that's what, um, say, a couple of other companies like Kaspersky, they're also doing. And um, there's right now two vendors, actually, who are actually, if I'm not mistaken, will be available as a download um, on the uh, Tizen App Store when it launches, which is McAfee and Kaspersky. So, you know, that's the other hidden agenda I have here, which is to get you guys interested in the content security framework enough to, to identify uh, that, you know what, you can maybe reduce your time to market by using this. And again, it's open source. We have very little control over this, other than, then, you know, maybe helping you guys out with documentation, how to write your own um, um, engines to hook onto this. Okay, so let's face it, phones are nothing without their app ecosystem in this day and age, right? So the app ecosystem in this case is represented by the Tizen store. Um, again, it, we're hoping that it's gonna be launching around November, that's what the, the Tizen store guys were telling me. Um, now this isn't something that they told me, but we actually figured this out on our own, which is we, we looked at a couple of available Tizen phones that was um, being demoed at the Tizen developer conference in, I believe it was in June or May in uh, San Francisco. We went over there, we kind of started looking through the device and seeing how many apps are available on the app store. So we roughly, the ecosystem is around 10,000 apps or less. Um, and there, there's only about two devices, right? I believe that will be launched. So you're looking at, looking at initially um, an ecosystem of 10,000 apps and increasing. Um, and there's roughly about 200 apps for the Tizen version of the wearable device. Um, so it's not a, you know, if you're looking to get into a new opera, this is the perfect time to do it. So how do apps get on the Tizen app store? Um, they go through an app validation process, which consists of two phases. Um, now, after an app as a developer has been submitted to the, uh, the Tizen store, what the uh, first phase does is basically run an inspection, um, automated, dynamic analysis. Um, it's, it's based off of emulators, and there's actually quite a lot of documentation on this. And what they do is they literally just run your app on a live emulator, and they basically see what are the inputs and outputs. They try to simulate interactions with the app to see if there's certain um, functionalities that would trigger some more um, inputs or outputs. And based on that, they, they basically give it a pass or fail. If it's been flagged, it goes here. I mean, all apps go through here anyway, but it, it goes within with an extra note saying, look, there, there's something that flagged in phase one. You may want to take an extra look at it in phase two. Phase two is human and static analysis. It, this is something Samsung has said that they are going to do. So it goes through an automation as well as a human inspection process. Um, and the best part, Tizen has said, uh, this is the part that always causes a little bit of a concern. Samsung said that they'll turn around any app submitted to them within three days, maximum. So this entire process, you can send in thousands of apps, three days, that's a turnaround time. Now again, like I said, Bada, to its credit, the, the, some of the guys behind us are the same people using the, you know, who were behind the Bada project in the App Store. Bada, to its credit, um, we have never heard or seen any malware on it. So, you know, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe they can pull it off, but if the, the app, ecosystem explodes, you get thousands of developers come here, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if that three day time period will hold. Um, so again, so a little bit more detail about what happens during those three days. Um, the app is analyzed, um, it's actually the opposite. So the dynamic analysis basically brings back instrumentation of what were the URLs being contacted, um, you know, did they have a reputation on them? Um, and they're, they're using, a, um, they're using um, an array of AV engines as well. So it, it, they try to figure out if there's any detection on this from any standard um, equivalent of, um, of an AV engine. Um, and when it passes through both of these things, then it gets um, an analysis done to basically confirm that the permissions that are being asked for by the app are the bare minimum of what the app needs. So if it's an app, I don't know, just uh, that doesn't require certain permissions, they will stop that app from being published. They'll ask for an explanation from the developer, why do you need this permission? You don't need it for this app. And after that, it gets onto Tizen store. So 
the reevaluation occurs when the app has been updated, and again, that same process continues from this point onwards. Okay, third-party stores. Now, as I said, that there's there's two signatures. So we we are um, Samsung has been a little bit quiet about this, but we are expecting them to facilitate um, uh, basically uh, you know, third-party stores um, in, in, uh, in around the world. So we do believe there will be third-party stores, um, but what we still don't know about is if sideloading will be not allowed. Sideloading right now is allowed on the developer devices as well as on the phones, um, but we don't know what the final uh, release product will have. Um, right now, there's like a half a dozen places where you can find people who were kind of anxious to get their developed apps um, out and distributed somehow. So you'll find a lot of you know, stuff on GitHub, a lot of third-party sites where you can actually download apps um, and, um, and basically uh, you know, investigate them. So ties in under attack. Now, this is the part that I, I like about the presentation the most. So as, as I mentioned, this operating system is right now out there on wearable devices, on um, cameras, um, in vehicles. That's the other part I forgot to mention. Jaguar and Toyota have both signed on. And you know, they, they, it makes sense if you think about it, right? They, they're a vehicle company. They don't want to be in the operating system business. They would rather leave it to somebody who's got experience in this, which is, you know, makes perfect sense a consumable um, electronic company to focus on creating the, uh, the value as far as in-vehicle uh, entertainment goes. So f there's, this was the first vulnerability that was discovered um, in the Bluetooth command functionality. Um, after you turn the Bluetooth off, it wasn't there. It, it didn't turn off. Um, here's another one. The camera, the NX3000, um, it comes with the um, you know, tag reader and writer, and by default, th there's about several guys out there who've been, you know, playing around with it, trying to customize the OS, they're trying to see, uh, look for uh, vulnerabilities. So one, there's, there's one gentleman out there, what he did was he basically found out that the, the, the tag on the uh, device was rewritable. So the functionality was you've got a camera, you basically, any kind of Android device, you touch it against the camera and to, to create a positive user experience, if the camera has an NFC reader, you'd be able to directly download the app from Samsung to interact with the camera. You know, so you don't have to worry about setting up Wi-Fi, setting up what's the SSID, setting up the Bluetooth connection. You don't have to worry about that. But what they also realized was you could actually change that to something else. So instead of going to Google Play, you can actually redirect that to any package on Google Play. That was, that was something very easily changed. And there was no signature verification or anything that needed to be done to, to redirect this thing. Um, so, you know, the other thing is that the, the tag supports permanent write locking. So if you decided to create a custom OS and distribute it, you know, like I said, um, the RPM packages, they don't have to be signed and they're not verified on a device. So you can, you can be installing a malicious RPM package with, with you know, the, um, the perception that it's a clean um, um, contribution to the open source community. So. So here's another example. Um, somebody actually decided to take one of the cameras and do a you know, NMAP scan, and they actually found out that the port is open. I'm not sure if you can see that there. For X11, right there, 6,000. So you know, what you can do is, uh, it was limited what you could do here. I mean, they, they kind of ended up sending a couple of images to the device. Um, the other thing was that you could also do a DDoS attack and take out a camera. But um, again, one of the things that you want to keep an eye on um, so the other thing that was, um, you know, something that one of um, a gentleman who I worked with a couple of years ago, Candace, actually found out, was um, that ties in devices can be rooted. Um, they, they, you know, just so that if anybody's looking for additional customization, example, the watch, uh, you know, they, they're not happy with the, the fact that in certain regions, like in Japan, where it is mandatory for mobile recording devices to have an audible alarm, you know, you, you can basically root the device and basically disable the alarm, which is, again, kind of breaking the law, but customizing it. And there, there's roughly about two currently available uh, root exploits that can give you root access uh, on Tyson. Irvin? Okay. Could you round up, please? We uh, absolutely, sir. Nearly there. <laughs> okay, so the last thing, um, one of the things that is, of course, a sign that the ecosystem is under attack, malware. We've started to see posts on sites, and we're, we're actively trying to chase down these guys. 
where they've actually called out spyware, claiming that it is available on Tizen devices. Again, the device has not been released, so what we suspect is they probably attended a developer conference or are probably using something off of the emulator to get these apps. So, you know, we, 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 I don't believe, I, I think it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that I, I, before the year is out, we can expect to see the first Tizen malware out there. That's it.